called tree mapping. Okay, it's an algorithm. And the size of the story, the size of the box is proportional to the number of related articles on Google News. The color of the box relates to one of these categories at the bottom. So over here is nation, right? You can see world, I'll remove it. And the darkness of the box is related to the recency that the article was posted on Google News. So the brightest color is less than 10 minutes ago. Um, the middle shade is more than 10 minutes ago, and the darkest shade is more than an hour ago. So I can see a map of all of the news going on in the United States based on Google News. And I can go back to another point in time, and there's a totally different map. I want someone to animate this so we can see how news is shifting over time. I also really want someone to, someone i.e. someone here maybe, to take Maramushi and start adding photos to it. So now the size of the photo is proportional to the size of the story. And it's a mechanism for truly seeing the news. What is the Mar Mar it's, I, OK, so all the links are available on my website um, to this thing. So if you're writing down furiously, you can keep writing down furiously because it makes me kind of feel good. But um, <laughs> it's, this is called Marumushi News Map. And if you go to marumushi.com, you can find it in a list. And there's a longer link that's available on my website, which is um, dot scoop dot com, which is also linked on sethfamilian.com. Let's look at another one, because there are more visualization tools. Here's 10 by 10. Speaking of pictures, this was designed by a guy named Jonathan Harris, who is like the interaction design guru of the century. Um, these are all the photos, that, the top 100 photos that popped up on the AP Newswire today, I think. And um, they all have keywords associated with them. So when you mouse over the photo, the keyword will pop up on the right-hand side. Or if I go through the keyword, you'll see the photo get highlighted. I click on the keyword, and all of a sudden it gives me the photo and then all of the associated headlines that then link to different articles somewhere else on the web. And I can click on the photo and make it really big, and then click on it and make it small. This is what I mean by visual. And by the way, um, this is not such a great example of active, but this mapped up is a great example of active, meaning it reaches out to you. Okay, I'm not doing anything, I'm not navigating. It's showing me things, it's feeding things to me. There's a guy who I used to do some work with as part of Faith Popcorn's Brain Reserve, which was this marketing strategy firm I used to work for. And his name was Dr. Cloutier Repay. And he's like the most amazing child psychologist turned branding expert I've ever met. And he did some consulting work for Palm about two or three years before I'd worked with him, so like five years ago. And he, figured out the code for Palm, the code for handhelds, which is like the essence of handhelds. And he said, today it is one or two touch, and tomorrow it is no touch. I'm like, what? And then he explained what he meant. He said, it's active, meaning it reaches out to you. You don't have to touch the device. The device vibrates whenever it needs your attention for something. Think about that within the context of user experiences online. They're so focused on you doing things, they tend not to reach out to you very much. And yet, you see really good examples of it happening all over the place. Look at YouTube. Go to YouTube's homepage, right? And if I go ahead and reload YouTube's homepage, look at that. Video is being watched right now. Is there any animated advertising on this page? No. No. There's only animated content on the page. And that's a fight you're going to get into with your business people, OK? They're going to want to put video ads all over the page. To, distract, you know, to get the attention of the reader and to try and monetize them. I would argue the only things you animate on your pages are content. And you let print be print, and you monetize static image ads, which a lot of people would find to be anathema in this day and age. But I find animated ads distracting. And I find this stuff interesting because it engages me. It reaches out to me. It says, hey, this is new. Hey, this is interesting. And we're all kind of ADD in this world, right? We're mobile. We're flying on Virgin America all over the world. So, moving along. Sorry. Okay. So, Visual Native, you saw Marmushi. You saw 10 by 10. Where can we expect to find these experiences? Where are we going to find them in five minutes? <laughs> You're going to find them across platforms. You're not just going to find them on a web browser. You're going to find them in emerging software, and you're going to find them in emerging hardware. So, when I say across platforms, Think about a news story, right? Its first articulation online is in a browser window on a desktop computer, probably, or a laptop, right? But think about where else it could go. It would live in an RSS feed in another format. 
It would live on a cell phone in another format, in an SMS or an MMS message. It would live on an iPod in a, in a podcast, perhaps. It would live on a PSP, maybe as a text story, maybe as a photo story. It would live on a printer as a printer-friendly version, right? So the point is, is that one story has different articulations across totally different platforms. And that's how you have to think about your content. It's not just about print anymore. It's about content having a certain fidelity, right? So I find news content to be low fidelity content versus magazine content to be high fidelity content. Why? Because the magazine content is reliant upon the layout of the page and the glossiness of the publication and all this other stuff in order to bring forth the rich magazine experience. But sometimes the newspaper content is relegated to give me the story. And especially as it starts proliferating on different platforms, it's now give me the story any way that I can take it. So if I want it as an RSS feed or on my cell phone, please give it to me. The fidelity of the story doesn't matter, the content of the story matters. One of the best examples of this in action, well, this is a quick example, which is just a Helio cell phone with a MySpace news thing on it. But the better example is a company called Daily Me. And Daily Me is a website that offers a really interesting service. You create your account, you choose your content, they have partnerships with all of these newspapers, some of whom you are affiliated with, and then you get to set your delivery preferences. And when I say set preferences, I mean, when am I going to get the thing delivered, right? I want it on Sunday, Monday, and Thursday at 11 a.m., and I want it in email form. And I can do this as many times as I want on Daily Me. And this is after, by the way, I've specified on Daily Me all of the content that's relevant to me, right? So I say, let's go to sources, and I want AP, and I want AP World News, and I'm going to add it give it to me, and boom, it's in my selections, right? So this is my daily me page. And now what I can do is I can go up to delivery, and I can say here, I want, a mo I want an email version, sorry, no, I want a mobile version at 11 a.m. By the way, this is on Eastern time. It's a big flaw in their database. Um, I want a mobile version at 11 a.m. And, and a print version on weekends at 11 a.m., and I want a mobile version at 9.30 p.m. Why mobile version versus email version, by the way? Because if you ever try and read an email on your BlackBerry, God help you if it has a picture or two in it. It's like just mess, right? So the mobile version is text only. And the email version has images in it and line breaks and all the fancy stuff. The point is, is that Daily Me understands context. They understand how to be context savvy and to deliver content within a context savvy uh, state of mind. And I think that's really, really important for anyone who's thinking of delivering content to a super mobile connected entitled consumer to think about. Okay. Why won't this load? Okay. Um, and they have these print versions too. These, these printed versions where they basically will dynamically lay out an entire mini newspaper in PDF form and will email it to you. And you'll print it out on your printer. And it's like you've got your mini newspaper in your hand. And guess what? This is the best monetization tool possible for you guys because these things command potentially print rates because they're much stickier than a browser. So when you start thinking about, you know, when you're talking earlier about how do you charge someone, right? How do you command a premium? Well, sometimes it's not actually about catching them at the gate when they find it on Google News and they go to your website and you're like, pay me. Instead, it's I'm gonna provide a service. I'm gonna give you our content in every way that's relevant to you and in the ways that are most relevant to you, if there's willingness to pay, maybe on a custom laid out version, then I'm gonna charge you. Or it's gonna be free, but I'm gonna charge my advertisers much more because this is a much stickier version. That page lasts five hours instead of five seconds. Emerging software. Why am I showing the iPhone on emerging software? Because the most important thing about the iPhone to me is not the phone itself, it's pretty, but it's the widgets on the iPhone. These guys, which by the way, aren't on the iPhone right now. So Apple's developed this amazing landscape of widgets. And there are these little pop-up applications that have tons of content that's relevant to any given consumer. My Dig Stories, my BBC News. But the iPhone is proprietary, and the iPhone locked down all of the widget ecosystem. So still, these widgets are going to ultimately transform mobile devices. Because to me, it's not about having the mobile web on your cell phone, per se. It's about having internet-connected content on your cell phone in a meaningful way. And Google Android, which is the operating system that Google is developing and is launching pretty soon, is going to do just that. So 
When you think about widgets and you think about what is Google going to do, th that's where they're going to play, by the way. And that's how they're going to get content to people in a meaningful way. Can you say that one more time? Google Android is basically going to democratize the proliferation of widgets on cell phones. And widgets are these little content-rich applications that currently sit on our desktops and they don't seem very useful. But once they end up on devices that are mobile, they get tremendously useful very, very fast. And the iPhone has widgets, but they only have a very proprietary it's set of them. Dig news on your phone. Boom, it updates all the time. So there's the dig story. I click the, I click the button to see more, and boom, I'm taken to the story on my phone. It's a point of entry. So Google's system is sort of going to do what Facebook did. It's going to throw the data to my own. It's exact, yeah, so Google's system is going to do exactly what Facebook did. They're building a platform, an application platform. And they're saying, go develop. I mean, Sergey Brin was on, like, go check out the Sergey Brin video. It's amazing. He's on YouTube, and he says, I ask you to develop the greatest application for Android possible, and we will pay you a million dollars. Go. I'm looking forward to seeing your work. I was like, wow, that's audacity. <laughs> but that's what he, I mean, that's exactly what they did. And it was very smart. They're building application platforms. Um, the, the same thing is kind of happening in desktop software as well. So um, the New York Times had this thing called the New York Times Reader. And it was this standalone piece of software that you could download. And um, now they're charging for it, actually. They're charging 15 bucks a month. And it basically emulates the layout of the print newspaper. It's a very slick piece of software. I lost my subscription to it, by the way. It's a long story. Um, but in any case, this thing did not gain traction at all. It actually, I think the New York Times kind of quietly like brushed it aside. It's like, oh, we didn't have a reader. What are you talking about? It was built on something called the Windows Presentation flat Platform and, or WPF, Windows Presentation Framework. And actually, Adobe has created a similar framework called Apollo. The idea is build an application that sits on your computer that has internet connectivity, but doesn't need to be connected to the internet all the time in order to work. So this thing just basically synchronizes with the internet. So this little thing up here, this little synchronization button and this little green bar is the progress bar that says, here's how much time until we've loaded your next version of the New York Times and we're going to archive seven days worth of the New York Times within the application as well. Why is this thing not gaining traction? Because it seems pretty cool. Well, it's because the devices haven't really emerged in the marketplace to be a home for this thing. And people, I mean, I don't really see a lot of people lugging around their laptops and reading them like newspapers. <laughs> I mean, I kind of tried to. I have a tablet, right? So I was trying to, and it was a huge pain in the butt. But when you start looking at all this emerging software within the context of, of emerging hardware, like the Amazon Kindle, and the fact that right now it's a very minimalist, simplistic text-based experience, but once you start applying the Windows Presentation Foundation on top of it, now you've got a serious, serious competitor to print. Because if you're able to emulate the print experience in a meaningful way, and it's accessible, and it's intuitive, et cetera, now the software and the hardware starts coming together. There are other ebook readers that are out there, too, that are relevant, not just the Amazon Kindle. IRX has one. Sony has one. Polymer Vision. See, they all have different form factors. They're all leveraging this technology in different ways. The idea is they're trying to figure out ways to replace print, and they're trying to figure out ways to emulate the print, the low-fidelity print experience in a meaningful way. Ultra-mobile PCs are another piece of emerging hardware that are important to know about. And they're effectively like internet tablets, all right? So these things are dedicated to surfing the web. So imagine just your web page is mobile on a device. And then two final devices to consider, widget-driven devices. So remember those widgets I showed you? There's something called the Chumby, and it's like this little dinky thing that basically is a host for widgets. So it hooks up to your wireless network, and you can put it anywhere in your home, and it will cycle through widgets. So imagine, what if your, one of your widgets is on there, along with everything else? So now you've got another distribution mechanism. And finally, there are a lot of photography people here, right? There are a lot of people who are photographers or photo editors. Pay attention to digital photo frames in the next five years. Because I think they are the most powerful distribution platform for syndicating professional photo content. And I don't think anyone's tapped it yet, but be ready to syndicate it. Because as soon as these things get wirelessly enabled and you can start charging microtransactions to them or doing a monthly subscription to a photo service, now we've got some interesting ways to monetize the news in different ways. Think of the number of photos you guys have sitting around. And I've heard from people um, that the number of people visiting the photo sides of the website tend to be higher than any other part of the site. And that's just an audience begging for another outlet for distributing that content. So finally, because I know we're running out of time, um, how can newspapers thrive in this digital environment that I've just described, which is Admittedly, a slightly daunting environment, right? Well, 
three ways. Number one, optimize all of your existing revenue streams. So we're gonna talk business for a little bit. Number two, syndicate content on a new platform. So reach beyond what you've got today and start getting everything you've already been producing and you will produce out as far as possible. And then finally, incubate new ideas and being willing to take risks. When I say optimize, it really means optimizing that entire experience from search and search engine presence to discovering the content on your website, to monetizing the content on site, so making the most out of the ads on your website, to making the site as sticky as possible so people stick around, to encouraging repeat usage. Here's some examples of tools you can use to do just that. On discoverability, there's a company called EveryZing. They work with Boston.com amongst a couple of other newspapers, and they take a video and they transcribe it into text automatically, and then they make all this text searchable on Google automatically. So if you search, for a video, you're just searching for text terms, all of a sudden videos start popping up on Google. And they also facilitate insight search as well. Everything is a super interesting company that I saw um, present a couple months ago to a conference down in Silicon Valley. Takoda is a behavioral targeting company. So they enable the optimization of CPMs around display advertising on your website based on the behavior of those users. It will track where else those users have gone to different sites. It will um, basically correlate that user behavior with other websites and then we'll deliver the most appropriate ad possible. Local advertising, special, um, sorry, Centro is an ad network that specializes in local media, which means local newspapers and metropolitan newspapers, um, digital radio, local TV stations, et cetera. So these guys understand monetization of newspaper websites very well. And finally, Rubicon Project is the most fascinating advertising related startup I've seen. They are a meta ad network or an ad network of ad networks that has written some crazy algorithm and they optimize your entire site ad buy around like 9,000 different dimensions and they basically pit all of the different ad networks against one another for the highest CPM and get you the highest CPM possible. So they are super interesting and in beta right now. Deploying sticky tools, right? So an example is a company called LingoSpot. Unfortunately, I can't show you the demo right now, but basically they scan through all of the content on a given page and will highlight key terms like space race in an article. You mouse over onto space race and it will say, here are all the related articles on space race in your website. Oh, and by the way, here's the Wikipedia definition of space race. Here are some books on the space race and here are some blogs on space race. So it's a tool that's in context, it's in sight. It takes one line of Java to deploy but what it does is it makes your site super sticky because it takes all the keywords that could be in an article and it turns them into points of reference to other articles within your site. Hence, you can monetize more of your site on any given user visit. It's called LingoSpot. LingoSpot. Lingo Lingo so syndication is also really important. Um, remember that ecosystem we talked about before? Engage it as much as possible. Make sure that when you are publishing articles that you are finding the right way to syndicate those links to those articles everywhere you can. Because that way, you'll gain the highest potential for readership just by engaging that social bookmarking network. Extend onto new platforms and devices. Partner with Daily Me if you haven't been partnering already with them. Talk to Amazon.com about getting your RSS feed onto their Kindle because they charge for every single newspaper subscription. It's like 15 bucks a month from the New York Times and it's a text version. So, if you're not playing that game, you should be because it's another way to, to, it's called sweating your content to get the most value out of your content possible. Mochilla is a very interesting startup that specializes in doing just that. They take professionally provided content and they link it up with people who are looking to republish content on their websites. They're basically a matchmaker and an automatic content syndicator. Uh, finally, incubate really interesting ideas. And I swear we're wrapping up in the next five minutes. Number one, there's nothing I hate more than turning on my mobile phone and going to a website on my mobile phone and it being the normal website and not a mobile version of the website. It just kills me. But a lot of, comp a lot of companies, not just newspapers, but companies as a whole, don't get this. And yet it's critical to build tools into your websites that detect what kind of browser is accessing the website and to then deliver an appropriate user interface. There's a company called Quattro Wireless that enables that capability for mobile websites. It'll take your actual website, it'll automatically reconfigure it into a mobile version without you having to do any work, and we'll create a mobile version of your website. Build social network applications. Someone was like, how? Someone earlier said, how do I build social network applications? There's something called the Snap Summit. 
the Social Network Application Provider Summit. It's sponsored by Facebook. There are like 400 people who show up and all they do all day long, for some reason, I don't know how they pay for their like regular lives, is they build Facebook applications. So these people are all in one place. And if you want to tap into that ecosystem and figure out a way to get onto Facebook, go there first. Also build widgets. Because as I said, widgets are going to be at the forefront of mobile telephony in the next five years. I'm convinced they are going to be the internet portal, not just the mobile web. So building widgets that are compatible with mobile phones are extremely important. And then finally, there's a company called Proximic, and they create um, contextually relevant recommendations, sort of like what LingoSpot did. Um, they do it as a sidebar and a widget in your website as well. So they're another interesting resource to consider. And then finally, on the incubation front, think about crazy, crazy projects, like information visualization, like some of the Maramushi stuff I was showing you earlier. There's a company called, it's not a company, it's actually an open source collective. It was founded by a PhD candidate at Berkeley named Jeff Heer, and it's called Prefuse. It's an information visualization toolkit. It's open source, it's totally free. It's available at prefuse.org, and you can use, you can build these kinds of visualizations super easily. If you have a, a coder, an engineer who knows JavaScript, uh, then they can do it. They've even written one in Flash as well. So, why did I just show you like 25 different companies in my last set of slides? Well, because you can't do this on your own. Because you're journalists, and you're really good at that, and you're really good at investigative reporting, and you're really good at telling the story. But when it comes to leveraging technology to get that story out in the most meaningful way, it's basically impossible to try and build it all on your own. So, the reason why I just showed you 20 different companies in a very overwhelming way, because I'll probably make the presentation available online too, is because you've got to prioritize partnerships. You've got to reach beyond yourselves, and you've got to figure out a way to tap the right people, the right companies and startups that are looking to experiment, and partner with them, and build things with them. That way you're going to be able to leverage the expertise not just of yourselves, but of everyone around you. Involve your readers in this process. Remember, they're mobile, they're connected, they're entitled, they want to have a part. They want to create their own brands, they want to own them. So involve them in the process of innovation. Get them inside and interview them. Ask them questions about things you're developing. Include them in alpha and beta test teams. Make them feel important, which means beta test. Don't just say, we are going to do the web revamp, and as, when it can't be finished, say, we're not going to you know, launch it until it's 100% done. That's just not the way the product development cycle works online. It's got to be iterative, and you've got to be willing to put things that are not 100% complete out there, test them with a small group of readers, test them with a large group of readers, see what works, see what doesn't, and then iterate, which is the final point. Innovate and iterate and innovate and iterate and then iterate again and then iterate again. Because I've been giving this speech 15 times over the past two years and I was just telling my friends, I rewrote it last night. Because it's all about iteration and it's all about seeing what you have currently and then building on top of it or taking it in a new direction. And I think if you're, if you're able to describe by this philosophy, then you're not just going to be able to survive in the digital world, you're going to be able to thrive. So if it feels like all of what I've said is great, but you don't have a lot of tactical advice to like actually do some web app building, and I'm sure you're going to be building those skills over the next couple days as well, here's a really good book to read. 37 Signals is a company that developed some really, really cool web applications like Basecamp and Backpack and Campfire, and they've built a really interesting book around simple development, simple principles for developing web apps. It's called Getting Real, the Smarter, Faster, Easier Way to Build a Successful Web Application. So I hope that helps. I hope I've been helpful. And thank you so much for being such a great audience. <laughs>